Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TDWI webinar program. I'm Andrew Miller, and I'll be your moderator. For today's program, we're going to talk about how AI chatbots augment the BI experience. And our sponsor today is Metric Insights. For our presentations today, we'll hear first from James Kavilis with TDWI. And after Jim speaks, we'll have a presentation from Mike Smitherman with Metric Insights. Before I turn over the time to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few basics. Today's webinar will be about an hour long. And at the end of their presentations, our speakers will host a question and answer period. So if at any time during these presentations you'd like to submit a question, just use the Ask a Question area on your screen to type in your question. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can click on the Help area located below the slide window, and you'll receive technical assistance. If you'd like to discuss this webinar on Twitter with fellow attendees, just include the hashtag TDWI in your tweets. And if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, please locate the resource window to download the PDF. Lastly, we are recording today's event, and we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version so you can view the presentation again later if you choose, or if you'd like to share with a colleague. All right, again today we're going to discuss how AI chatbots augment the BI experience, and our first speaker today is James Kabilis. He's the Senior Director of Research for Data Management at TDWI. Jim is a veteran thought leader, industry analyst, consultant, author, and speaker on analytics and data management. And over the past three decades, Jim has held analyst positions at Futurum Research, Wikibon, Forrester Research, Current Analysis, and the Burton Group. He also served as a senior program director for product marketing for big data analytics for IBM, where he was both a subject matter expert and a strategist on thought leadership and content marketing programs targeted at the data science community. At TDWI, Jim focuses on data management, which encompasses database platforms, data governance, data integration, master data management, data ops pipelines, and more. Welcome, Jim. And with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a good day. So let's move to discuss how AI chatbots are augmenting the BI experience. Um, you know, augmented BI, really, we call it augmented analytics at at TDWI, same difference. It's the same phenomenon. It's the same trend that's been going on for several years to really improve how BI tools, business intelligence tools, um, help to guide and accelerate users on their journeys through data and analytics to find answers and insights that they need to do their jobs well. Um, so really augmented analytics uh, uses increasingly uses ever more sophisticated artificial intelligence to help users on their journeys, to guide them through ever more complex data sets, and to guide users, provide them with recommendations for the right data, the right visualizations, and so forth. And increasingly augmented analytics tools are incorporating um, large language models, which have LLMs um, for short, which have come into the mass consciousness over the last six to eight months, thanks to such things as especially ChatGPT, where there's an LLM at the heart of ChatGPT, and really, ChatGPT is the is one of the AI chatbots, and not the only one, of course, out there. Far from it, um, in the world around us, and that you know, AI chatbots are becoming an increasingly important and integral feature of so many applications, and including especially uh, business intelligence. So, uh, really, artificial intelligence. Um, is really has been around for quite a long time, almost as long as I've been alive, and I'm no spring chicken. Artificial intelligence is bringing augmented decisioning into everything, and this has been going on for years. And uh, the state of the art in AI continues to evolve and expand and incorporate established approaches and newer approaches and ever more sophisticated capabilities that essentially are used to uh, to drive algorithmic, data-driven decisioning. Um, into everything we do, you know, into every application, be it uh, applications such as business intelligence or embedded applications uh, in your enterprise supply chain and your factory floor, mobile applications that you provide to your customers and employees and stakeholders. Really, artificial intelligence is inside of everything, including especially business intelligence. In fact, it's AI-driven BI, augmented analytics has been a top trend uh, for a number of years now in the business intelligence space. In many ways, AI-driven uh, uh, business intelligence journeys are have become the mainstream uh, throughout the business world. 
And you know what they do is they drive the, the core of AI, which is predictive analytics, real time analytics and descriptive analytics into a broad range of uh, you know, decisioning scenarios related to enterprise data uh, and enterprise decisioning. So when we look at artificial intelligence, there are really four broad um, use cases in, in the broadest sense uh, under which AI is brought into applications of all sorts. The clue is for automation, using AI to completely automate some process without a human being being involved manually at any point of the, in the process. There's autonomy, which is essentially the ability of an AI-driven application or device um, or vehicle for that matter, um, like an EV, to uh, be able to operate entirely independently of both of humans at, or of any other non-local system. Um, actuation, which refers to uh, sensor-driven AI um, to enable uh, artificial intelligence applications to take action based on the entire environment and the location and any number of real-time factors that include computer vision inputs that come in through you know, a growing range of sensors. And then there's augmentation, and that's the extent to which we discuss um, AI-driven decisioning to, in today's uh, uh, webinar. Augmentation is really AI augmented human capabilities, human cognitive capabilities in the decision or action loop uh, for you know, myriad applications. So augmented business intelligence driven by AI, especially by the new mainstream, one of the new mainstream approaches increasingly becoming, entering the mainstream, which is LLMs, large language models. So large language models as a subset of natural language processing um, or as an, an implementation of it, um, natural language processing has been the core use case of artificial intelligence from the very start of this field. And when I say the very start of this field, we're talking about the late 40s and early 50s. We're talking about the theoretical explorations of Alan Turing and, and others in natural language processing related to something called the imitation game, um, whether a, a, you know, an AI-driven program can, as it were, impersonate an actual human being by answering questions as well as a human being could, so that another a human being asking those questions would not know whether it was an actual authentic human being or a computer answering. So what we're, we're talking about is this is the, the, the core use case of AI from the start natural language processing. It's based on automated understanding of text and automated generation of text in a conversational context. That's the traditional use case. That's the core use case of large language models like chat GPT, conversational contextual response, intelligent question answering, and really natural language text, mining text analysis, authoring, you know, auto completion, correction, classification, labeling, summarization, disambiguation, integration, synthesis, editing, translation, and so on and so forth to enable these capabilities to be automated to a greater degree using embedded large language models, which are a type of neural network model, uh, a very large neural network models of increasing complexity that can do amazing things that many of us, including myself, have played with chat GPT, for example, and we, yes, they're able to write convincing enough blog posts, draft news copy, author research reports, compose term papers, answer test questions, you know, code and debug computer programs and so forth. You know, what we're seeing, it's amazing that um, now it's mainstream that anybody can, you know, ace Alan Turing's imitation game uh, by basically being able to, with uh, textual prompts, uh, generate an output that looks like a human being wrote it, but in fact it was written by a very large and complex large language model that was trained on a lot of textual data and so forth, social media data, website data, and so forth. So large language models have changed the state of the art in natural language processing. And you know, what are LLMs and how do they work? Well, they're a, a, a category of a larger phenomenon uh, and trend called generative AI basically leveraging LLMs, leverage uh, textual inputs, prompts or instructions in a chat interface to, to, to generate textual outputs of various sorts. 
and really the LLMs that sit there are neural networks, machine learning models, um, that are essentially probability distributions over a sequence of words or other linguistic units. Another phrase or word that's used to describe this phenomenon are tokens, or sequences of tokens um, in training data. And basically, the models themselves, um, because they're statistical algorithms, they contain, well, they are statistical algorithms that contain upwards of millions, billions, and increasingly trillions of parameters uh, of the task involved. And the, uh, the, and the parameters are updated through the training process. And what the parameters refer to um, is that there are elements of a task, uh, such as understanding and generating text, let's say translating from English to French, that a model learns from historical training data. Um, LLMs, um, the, these models are increasingly, uh, not just huge, but growing at a, a historical rate of 10x per year as their performance increasingly improves. Uh, and they're able to do amazing things based on um, less and less domain-specific uh, training data. In other words, uh, they're able to do amazing things based on what's called few shot or no shot inferencing that relies on little domain tailored training data. So they, they very much LLMs change the state of the art in natural language processing. And they're flexible enough to be adapted to new tasks that are related to or similar to the, the initial task with very little additional training data being training being needed. Um, and so forth. Um, but they can do amazing things when you do a little bit of uh, uh, fine tuning with fresh domain data, but I'm not gonna go there today. So LLMs um, leverage a growing range of sophisticated statistical modeling approaches. Like I said, they're machine learning models with artificial neural networks at their heart. Now we have seen the development of LLMs on top of uh, leveraging deep learning models like conv convolutional neural networks Neural, neural networks and things like generative adversarial networks. But in the last few years, since 2018, when Google released BERT, which really changed the state of the art, transformer models, uh, which incorporate both transfer learning and what are called self-attention mechanisms have changed the landscape of LLMs and are wicked good and wicked intelligent, like I said, with very, the very little need for domain-specific training data but now there's also another approach called diffusion models that incorporate a technique known as iterative denoising mechanisms. I'm not going to try to delve into all of these, but only to point out that when you look at BI and other tools that leverage LLMs, increasingly they're leveraging LLMs that are built on transformer models and to some degree of diffusion models, which are the state of the art. And I'm definitely not going to read this eye chart other than to point out that this development, this innovation in LLMs has only been in the last, predominantly in the last six to seven years. In 2018, OpenAI released the initial GPT, Google released the initial version of BERT and so forth. And a lot of other commercial and research organizations over the world over have continued to release new LLMs, different types of LLMs of various sizes, geared to various tasks, you know, not limited to just text to text generation, but also text to image, text to music, text to video generation. It's uh, it's an amazing amount of innovation going on. As you can see, there was like a, a small lull at the beginning of the lockdown period in 2020, but it's heated up over the last several years. And this 2023 list of when was it these the, when were these models released? Um, is as good as I can get up to about two weeks ago when I finished this slide deck. Clearly, we're, we're not even halfway through 2023. There will be more. Um, it's just a matter of staying up with the news cycle and reading the research to find out what's going on. In the business intelligence arena, um, there's, there's an ongoing trend. At TWI, we have, research, we have done surveys over the last several years um, asking uh, BI users what their requirements are and increasingly, you know, many of them say, well, you know, we know that AI can make BI tools more useful, um, personalize them to our specific needs and accelerate us, uh, our journey of finding the insights we need in the data. So in 2021, uh, we asked them, um, you know, what, uh, what do you need from AI? What do you expect AI to deliver inside of your BI experience? 65% said AI is needed to augment their own 
human decision-making capabilities. 52% they need AI to automate the discovery of actionable insights in, in a BI experience. 44% AI said AI is uh, principally useful to accelerate analytics on growing data volumes to enable a scale, a scalability um, from the user uh, experience point of view. 35% they said they rely on AI to help them find, select, and use the right data for analysis. 32% that AI is essential for reducing their need to manually uh, wrangle or prep data um, and curate it uh, to make it useful and uh, discoverable uh, and actionable for a variety of business uh, uses. So clearly BI users expect AI augmented features in their experiences. So it really BI's new mainstream is that AI chatbots as an embedded capability are increasingly powering uh, experiences that help users get what they need while they're using BI tools in the first place. Um, the state of the art increasingly BI is, you know, embedded AI chatbot experiences, helping to recognize speech in conversational user interfaces. So you can ask your BI tool in language that's meaningful to you, you know, to find this or to fetch that or find an insight relevant to some task, uh, some outcome you're trying to achieve that AI embedded chatbots are able to increasingly infer users' intentions from natural language and thereby adapt, help them adaptively refine under the covers query results that deliver the insights relevant to addressing those intentions. Um, that AI accelerates the, the profiling, transforming, and wrangling of data. It automates the personalization of the, what the BI tool returns in terms of uh, responses to pre-built queries, reports, and visualizations, um, able to be AI is able to dis, uh, distill um, predictive insights uh, and, and really distill search results and query results uh, more rapidly and personalize them to individual needs or to the task at hand or where the user is on their BI journey. Um, AI is a part of the BI experience is able to generate smart recommendations uh, to help users find the right data sets, dashboards, visualizations, charts, and other analytics. And AI is able to produce natural language explanations of each query response, algorithmic insight, and rendered visualization. In other words, AI in the BI experience is able to provide transparency into how an answer was delivered. So the user can understand entirely what they you know, apply, you know, a cognitive grain of salt to what they're seeing. But also you have the, the transparency necessary for a lot of uh, compliance uh, mandates um, to address them. So, you know, really when we look at really AI inside the BI experience, it's to enable better insight discovery, autonomously detect relevant patterns, adapt statistical models dynamically to fresh data, to interactions with the end user, to changing context um, in the user's search for insights automatically refine those insights to personalize them to particular users, roles, and personas, um, uncover trusted insights that the user may would not have known to ask for otherwise, and to ensure always that the best fit algorithms are always applied to every new analytical challenge. So automate insight discovery, deliver contextual guidance, delivering real-time personalized guidance through complex data sets, through complex, you know, reports and dashboards and so forth that pull out what's most relevant at any point in time to an end user's uh, request. In many enterprises that have been using BI for years, there might be hundreds of potential reports, pre-built -pre reports, for example, or charts that are relevant to a particular user's quest. You know, we have only so many hours in the day and so much patience, it's best to have the BI tool uh, uh, recommend, you know, what needle in that haystack we need to drill down to right away. And likewise, you know, leverage embedded AI to automatically tailor prescriptive next best action guidance. So the user is always on their quest, um, uh, taking the right set of steps to avoid wasting time and to find the insights they need without a whole lot of muss or fuss. Um, and so let me go here. And then using AI to deliver BI transparency, like I said, maintain a complete AI, AI helps the BI tool and the user maintain a um, complete audit trail of all the data, the metadata, the statistical models and other artifacts that shape specific guidance to illuminate the entire end-to-end -end pipeline. In other words, have pro provide end-to-end -end lineage of all the data and the models 
that were used to deliver some insight um, and really to auto AI to automatically generate natural language explanations of everything. So the chief takeaway before I hand it off uh, to Andrew to hand it over to Mike is uh, that intelligent chatbots um, really are, have revolutionized the BI experience. They enable fine-tuned personalization, contextualization, and delivery of actionable insights in a user-friendly way that leverages large language models, including but not limited to the GPT-4 that, that underlies chat GPT. There are so many others. But really, intelligent chatbots have augmented the BI experience so that users can pose their queries and questions and requirements and intents in natural language. And then the BI tool can deliver brilliant insights um, really rapidly um, in a way that's highly accurate. Uh, to help the user along rapidly towards uh, some uh, insight that uh, helps them do their job most effectively. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Andrew, and we're going to hand it to, he's going to hand it to Mike. Thank you very much, Jim. That was a great presentation. Uh, just a quick reminder to the audience that if you have a question, you can enter it at any time in the Ask a Question window. This does bring me to our next speaker. His name is Mike Smitherman with Metric Insights. Mike is the VP of Sales and Marketing with Metric Insights, and he has over 15 years of product and marketing experience in the business intelligence industry. Mike helped bring analytic products to market with senior roles at Seagate Software, AIM Technology, Tea Leaf, Acero, and Good Data. With that, Mike, welcome, and I will hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Jim. Certainly uh, an interesting discussion. Um, I, I'm going to sort of lead the discussion into sort of a, a practical implementation of what we're doing with uh, integrations with specifically GP, GPT-4 today, but LLMs in general at Metric Insights, and hopefully sort of give you some yeah, a, a sort of practical idea of, of how organizations like ourselves are sort of implementing the, these sort of technologies um, and kind of what they're good for and potentially what they're not great for at this point in time. Um, and I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes, um, just for those that aren't aware of sort of what we're up to at Metric Insights, give you sort of a foundation that we can use for, for that discussion. Um, so at, at Metric Insights, we're really a market to solve this problem that, you know, there's, there's an ever-increasing amount of money being spent on BI, an ever-increasing amount of content getting created, as, as Jim touched on. But reality is when you walk into large enterprises today, we're still seeing pretty poor ROI on those BI initiatives where you know, a lot of content is getting created, but a lot of it is also going unused. Um, where we're underutilizing the BI tool licenses that we're paying for, and we're seeing quite a lot of wasted time for both the analyst and business users, and I'll touch on why that is. And so, you know, what we see in the market is really the challenge that exists there is that there's a lack of sort of governance and control around BI um, processes. So as more and more content gets created, we're seeing more and more sort of cluttered BI environments where you find duplicative and obsolete content sitting alongside the production content that you want your users accessing. And without a doubt, you know, it's compounded by multiple sources of BI in an organization. Every large organization has multiple BI tools. There's reporting in every application out there today. And you know, everyone's still using spreadsheets and documents, and there's thousands and thousands of bits of content out there. And you know, the challenge becomes this level of friction between sort of the BI team and the business users, where you know, I'm seeing some questions come into the chat here around sort of what the role is of the BI team moving forward. Well, you know, analysts today are still spending a bulk of their time answering questions from business users based on sort of the scope of knowledge that they have around BI in an organization, you know, can you help me answer this? Can you tell me if this report exists? And oftentimes today, it's actually quicker just to recreate a report or create a new bit of content than it is to find something that's out there already. And from the business user perspective, yeah, there's an overwhelming amount of content. They don't know which versions of reports they can trust. They don't necessarily know what's out there and the context behind it, um, you know, Conversely, it's easier to pick up the phone than it is to actually use BI. And I paint a bleak picture, but you know, there's a lot of this going on in organizations where you know the BI team could be much more effective if if they had the time to spend on 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 the real work, if you like, the analysis. 
And so that's the problem where we're in market solves. So Metric Insights, our platform today, basically goes out and connects to every source of BI in the organization, you know, the BI tools, reporting in SaaS applications, spreadsheets, documents, data, wherever it might be. And we basically provide this engine where business analysts, BI teams can um, curate and publish, if you like, the, and certify the content that they want people using with all the context around what that content is in the form of metadata, so glossary terms, definitions, metrics that a report includes, ownership, um, all of that, you know, that is, is brought in from different sources or added as part of the publishing process to basically create this, um, if you like, catalog of, of BI that is ever changing and always relevant for users so that they have one place to come and find content within the organization rather than understanding the complexities of where, where it lives today. And so, you know, our customers are creating this centralized catalog of content that, um, yes, I can browse through, but I can also search into, and that's what we're going to be touching on today, is this idea of improving the search experience with, with AI and LLM integrations. Um, and we take that catalog and we go and, you know, also layer on a presentation layer in our portal that, you know, gives a very customized experience, personalized to the persona that is, is accessing BI in the organization, which is obviously very different if it's an analyst versus, say, an exec in your business. And we do that on the right device as well. So, you know, very quickly, this is what Metric Insights is up to, day, up to today creating this idea of a centralized catalog like you're seeing here where different assets are all brought together under one umbrella a single version of the truth if you like around content that we want people using organized in a single way so that when people access content regardless of source they get access to all the context behind it as well so what metrics does this report contain excuse me <clears throat> what how are they defined you know, how, how's this content tagged? Who owns it? Who's responsible for it? How is it categorized? What does it contain? I have all that context to understand whether this report is, is what I need. Now, a big part of our platform today is this concept of search. And, and you know, any portal is going to have some sort of search capabilities. And today, our search is very much sort of a Google-style paradigm where we collect all this metadata from the different tools around what the content is in the organization. And we use that to basically allow users to enter search terms. We do some basic natural language processing today to uncover sort of keywords and tokens in those search terms to bring back what is often hundreds of results, but similar to Google is, is ranked by an algorithm that hopefully bubbles up to the top what it is a user is searching for so that they can find things quickly. And we provide that through the portal. We provide it through the mobile app and, and through collaboration tools that we integrate like Slack and Teams. And it's really the search experience that I want to talk about now in terms of how AI, natural language processing, LLM integration can help improve this. So. What, would, what we've um, released and, and are building at Metric Insights is this concept of what we're calling a, a BI concierge. And I'll explain what that is. Today, we are doing that through an integration with GPT-4, as you'll see, but we're actually building it in a way that can integrate with a lot of different LLMs. You know, the market is changing daily, so we want some flexibility to be able to drive this from the latest and greatest models that are being created. And what it is, is if you think about that search experience that I mentioned just now that we have in the product, it, it's really optimized around finding content that I, I probably know exists already in the organization. So I'm coming in and I'm asking to you know, get access to some sales analysis reports or some marketing reports because I know they're out there somewhere. I just don't necessarily know where they are or maybe I know the name of it. I just don't know where to find it. And so if I search for things like that, it can deliver on the map very quickly. And more times than not, it's going to bubble those search results up to the top and, and I'm going to get access to things. What it's not great at is this sort of conversational discovery experience um, where 
you know, I, I'm trying to solve a particular business problem and there's maybe one or more pieces of content in the organization that help can help me get to the answer that I need. And in that sort of um, um, flow, it's typically a conversation that I need to have today with the BI analyst to get sort of a set of recommendations that are going to help me answer that question. And that's where this idea of the, the BI concierge comes into play play because as Jim alluded to, LLMs are very good at sort of this conversational aspect in this case of, of discovering content. And you know, you can draw the, the correlation, hence the name, to sort of the hotel concierge. If I go and visit a new country or a new city, what can I do? Well, I can go online and do a bunch of research and read the guidebooks. And with that scope of knowledge that I've been able to find, make some decisions about where I'm going to visit and where I'm going to eat and, and all of that. Or I can turn up at the hotel and speak to a concierge who has hopefully a much more up-to-date view of what's going on, a much broader depth of knowledge about the area that he's, uh, he or she is responsible for. And again, through a conversation, that has both clarifying and, and qualification questions can give me probably a much better set of recommendations of what it is I'm after. And we won't bring that experience to um, the, the BI discovery process. So, you know, what that manifests itself in, and we'll look at sort of a demo of this in, in a minute, is that both business users and business analysts, rather than searching for sort of key terms, can now start to answer much more sort of business focused questions that, that help them solve um, or help them answer um, what it is they're trying to achieve, whether it's, you know, recommendations around reports, whether it's, you know, I'm new to the business and I want to know what other people are using, um, whether it's the business analyst who's going to create content and wants to understand what other content is out there based on the lineage of everything from the data tables up through the reports. And you can read the sort of questions that we're trying to answer here. Um, but what's important is in this sort of experience, you know, if you think about what happens today when I pick up the phone to an analyst to ask these sort of questions, rarely is it a one time and done answer, right? As I ask questions, we have a conversation that clarifies what I'm looking for really uh, and gets me to a, a very sort of defined set of, of content that's going to help me. And you know, in a lot of cases, it's not just one report. And where the LLMs are very strong, and in this case, GPT-4, um, is, is inferring what it is that I'm actually asking. So in a question and a conversation like you're seeing on the screen right now, I mentioned that we collect a lot of metadata around what's, uh, what the content is. But what the LLM is very good at is inferring exactly what I'm trying to, uh, trying to get to the bottom of here. So a question like, can you suggest a report that shows me sales performance for a wine varietal that we're selling uh, across, uh, across the, the, the world in, uh, in our company here? Nowhere in the, in the metadata typically would you see product names like Pinot Noir. You know, we would just have reports and we would know that they contain product information or product categories and, and countries or whatever it might be. But the LLM is very good at sort of understanding that Pinot Noir is in fact a wine varietal and can make recommendations then by looking into the metadata and making those inferences. So, yeah. Let's take a look at the at sort of the metric insights implementation of this, and yeah, a couple of very simple examples that sort of bring it to light. But yeah, we can talk about sort of what's going on behind the scenes here. So what you're looking at here is uh, uh, is the metric insights uh, interface. So when you come in, there's sort of a Google cell window here where I can start to ask questions of, of the concierge. And you know, again, it, it, it can be sort of more conversational type questions, like I'm you know, trying to find a report to figure out why gross sales dropped in, in Canada last month, the region that I'm responsible for. And what the concierge is doing is basically integrating, in this case, as I mentioned, with GPT-4 to infer the, the reason behind that question and, uh, and what, what I'm trying to answer. It is integrating with the metadata that we're, we're collecting around about content that we have in that catalog and that portal that I spoke about. And it is basically taking into account things like popularity of reports as well as what they contain. 
I'm starting to make some recommendations based on that. So it's suggested three reports here that might help me answer the question. As it suggests reports, it builds up this carousel of content on the right-hand side. And if I click on those, I sort of get a preview and all the context around what that report actually is. So what metrics it contains, the owners of that report, descriptions, how it's categorized, what, you know, how, how, how popular it is with engagement, that sort of thing. And I can obviously click through these and, and get access to the live reports. But typically what happens is, again, the conversation continues. So, you know, I, I've been recommended some reports here that might help me explain gross margin. Um, but, you know, they look to be at the sort of product category level. And I'm actually interested in understanding how sales have been happening across our different channels online, um, in store sales. And so, you know, can you recommend something that will help me with that? And, you know, it can add that to the carousel as it comes up with additional recommendations um, and I can drill into those. So a very simple example, but a lot going on behind the scenes in terms of drilling into the metadata, understanding the inference of the questions and suggesting content around it. Um, another area that Jim touched on in his presentation is then you know, not just in terms of a discovery of content, but also in terms of automating some of the processes around this content as well. Um, so within our platform, we allow um, users within the portal to do a number of things, things like um, subscribe to content, things like share content with other users, things like uh, set up alerts on the content to be alerted when certain metrics hit a threshold so that they can come and send me then a, a particular report through email or mobile. Um, and those, those pieces of functionality require some level of knowledge by the user in terms of how to set them up. So if I'm going to subscribe to a report, yeah, I have to set up, you know, what report do I want to subscribe to? What's the schedule that I want to set that up on to receive it? How do I want to receive it? Is it through email or via Slack or in my mobile device? And whilst it's not you know, complicated, there's a level of training that has to go on to carry out those actions. Um, so what we can do is use the LLM to help guide the user and, and help perform those actions through conversation rather than UI elements. And so you know, simple examples might be you know, that idea again on the right hand side there of, of carrying out an action such as subscribing to the report. Well, again, what's involved with that? Um, we have to set up a schedule. We have to decide how we want to receive it. Um, so I can have these sort of guided conversations with the concierge and say, okay, subscribe me to this report. The concierge has a context around me as a user because it's, uh, it's, it's accessing our metadata behind the scenes. And it already knows that I'm actually receiving some reports in another distribution every eight o'clock on Friday in my email. And it can make some you know, intelligent recommendations around, well, do you want me to just add this into that particular distribution? Now, as a user, I can make some clarifying remarks. Maybe I don't. Maybe I need this because I've got a sales meeting on a Monday morning. I want it available to that. So, you know, no, send this to me through Slack at 8 a.m. on Monday morning because that's where I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on it. And the LMN can integrate with our... Uh, our uh, APIs then to, to set up that distribution. So what today would take a few steps in a wizard that were, the user would have to be aware of, they can now take through sort of more of a conversation. And the same thing, go, thing goes for things like, you know, sharing with another user. Yeah, you know, please uh, tell me who you, want the, who, who you want to share this report with and what you want to say. Again, I could do that through a simple UI today, or I could just type that into the, the, the chatbot here and have it generate the functionality behind the scenes. I think what's important is, you know, there's, there's a lot of hype around AI right now. And I think the risk that we run when we, we do implementations of, of AI technologies is we use it to try and sort of fit a, 
a round peg in a square hole. Um, you know, there are certainly function functionality, and this might be this last example might be touching on it. Where in some cases it might just be be easier to carry out through a UI based paradigm rather than a conversation, and so we we have to be conscious of that. Um, but in others, such as you know, here's another example. Let's set up an alert when sales in my region um, you know, drops below a certain threshold, I want to be alerted to that and sent this report. Well, in our product today, that's a four or five set, step wizard, wizard to set up that criteria. Well, having a conversation to do that might actually be easier. So you know, asking the, uh, the chatbot here to alert me if Canada drops unexpectedly for sales, it can make some intelligent recommendations around an algorithm for that. You know, let's look at if it drops 20% below the 30 day moving average, I'll send you an email at the time that that report updates every day. And again, let me adjust that if it's something, you know, I want to change the threshold or I want to be sent it in, a, in, a different, in a different way. And so using chat in that um, context where it is actually quite a uh, quote unquote complex process to do via the UI on the back end that requires training um, is perhaps something easier to, to adopt through a more sort of chat natural language interface. And that, that's really where applicability of an LLM, LLM integration comes into itself. So hopefully you're getting an idea around, you know, how these integrations can can sort of improve the experience. And yeah, you know, I'm sure, and I'm already seeing questions around how the role of the the BI analyst sort of changes, and whether this aug augments or or eliminates uh, that that role. Well, I think it's very much an, an augmentation um, um, thing today. Who knows where we'll get to in the future, but. You know, where if you think about those conversations that are happening where the, the business user is picking up the phone, I'm having to answer questions that are fairly mundane based on a limited scope of what's available from BI in these large organizations where there's thousands, if not tens of thousands of reports out there. We can automate that sort of process and free up the the analysts to uh, to be working on more high value activities, but we can also augment those activities, as I mentioned, with some of those questions previously. So, yeah, you know, if I'm new to the organization, responsible for marketing reporting in this case, you know, show me what some of the popular marketing reports that are out there that people are using allow me to understand you know if i'm responsible for creating a new customer focused report what the existing reports are based on in terms of data sources and and database tables to be able to ask those sort of questions and understand what other reports are based on that content on those tables so that i'm not um um, you know, duplicating content um, that is, is out there today, which is is key in driving this whole engagement paradigm with BI in the organization that I touched on initially. Um, I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about sort of the, the implementation of this in a little bit more detail. And then uh, I see lots of questions coming in. So I want to leave sort of a bit of time at the end for Jim and I to, to address some of those. But um, you know, the, the BI concierge that, that we're, we've implemented and that is um, 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 coming out for, for beta release in, in the next few weeks with our customers initially and, and will then be generally available is, is obviously available through our BI portal. It's also, we have integrations today, as I mentioned, with Slack, uh, with Slack and Microsoft Teams, where, where users can run searches from those platforms, and they'll also be able to interact with the BI concierge in those platforms. And importantly, and I'll touch on this in a second, we have a REST API into this concierge. That today is working with GPT-4 over there on the right-hand side, uh, the LLM. We are building it in a way that, as I mentioned before, will integrate with other uh, large language models um, that are you know uh, prevalent out there that Jim was talking about. That you know who knows will who will bubble to the top in terms of these battles that are going on. We want to be able to leverage the best for the job, 
Um, and it integrates with all that metadata that I was talking about before, as well as the security models, so that it's making recommendations based on what a user has access to or should be able to discover. And so at a very logical level, that's kind of what is happening behind the scenes. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with is, as we talk to particularly large enterprises today, um, there are these discussions going on across the organization, not just in sort of the BI department, as you can imagine. There's, there's discussions going on about building chatbots for customer support, for the IT help desk, to answer HR questions that employees had. All, all across the business, these things are getting developed. And what is becoming very uh, evident is that we need sort of a central environment where a user can ask their questions really regardless of the chatbot that is going to answer it behind the scenes. You know, the last thing we want to do is give the sort of cognitive overload to the user to really know which chat chatbot they should be having a conversation with, you know, similar to who I need to pick up the phone with to answer my question. We want to take that off their plate. And so we're building um, our, our integrations to be able to leverage um, the LLMs to do the necessary inference around intention to understand who needs to answer the question, or in this case, which chatbot needs to answer the question. And there's really sort of two um, architectures that can work for that in our environment. One is that we use the Metric Insights BI concierge to do that inference. So when a user asks a question, they come to the, the Metric Insights portal, they ask their question, we do the inference, or rather the LLM does the inference around which chatbot should be answering that. Is it a question around dashboards and reports? And therefore, we'll use our concierge to answer it. Or is it maybe something related to HR or customer service? And we do a handoff through our APIs and their APIs to make sure they're the ones answering the question there. Conversely, some enterprises are already down the path of creating sort of this centralized hub that is doing that inference already with their own integrations into a particular LLM. And that's, that case, that again comes um, back to having this idea of a API into our concierge where a user can go to this third-party chatbot that's been developed, they can ask their question, that chatbot will do the inference around what the question is. If it's a question around reporting and, and dashboards and content, it will pass it off to us through the API when we will pass the answers back to that chatbot. If it's a, a question around something else, it will understand that and, and pass it off to, uh, to, those, to, to the chatbot that needs to answer it. And so you know, it's important to think about the bigger picture as we think about um, all these projects that are going on in the BI space with different vendors and different organizations doing them themselves to you know, think about the typical business user and the bigger picture around what they're trying to achieve. So I know we've got about 11, 12 minutes left here, and I'm seeing lots of questions come in, Andrew and Jim. So, you know, at that, hopefully that's given you an idea of uh, one particular very thin sort of use case of, of, of an LLM integration and bring it to life a little bit. But maybe let's go look at some uh, questions, Andrew, and, uh, and start to get those answered. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a great presentation from you. Uh, we will go ahead and jump into the audience Q&A here. Uh, so, Mike, first question for you. How do you ensure a level of confidence in the answers that are coming back for users? Yeah, I think this, um, you know, I, I think this kind of comes back to sort of the round peg in the square hole com uh, comment that I made earlier. I think, you know, whilst things like ChatGPT are really set up to be answering a very broad array of questions right now. I think what you'll see with um, with implementations of this in sort of the, the corporate um, world is that you're really using these to target very specific use cases and actually training these models to answer very specific questions. And certainly what we're doing is, you know, actually giving behind the scenes we're not giving a great amount of flexibility to the LLM engine to just be able to create very creative responses to these questions. 
we're using the LLM to infer what the question is meaning and then actually taking some of the responsibility back in our engine to formulate the content through our search that is going to um, answer those questions and then give that back to the LLM to generate a more textual response. And with that, you know, we're pretty confident that then that the content that it is suggesting is, is accurate and is going to be useful. And so you know, keeping the guardrails onto the use case that you're trying to achieve, I think in the corporate world is, is super important right now. Um, because the last thing we want to do is generate more response, uh, sorry, more work, right? If I ask a question and I get bad recommendations, I, I, not only am I going to pick up the phone to the BI analyst like before, I'm going to pick up the phone and be angry about it because I didn't get an answer that I wanted in the first place and we want to eliminate that. And I'll answer, yeah, that was a great yeah. uh, response, Mike. You know, confidence in the answers, well, you know, this is business intelligence, so the data in the back end that is that responding to these queries is data that's in your data warehouse and other you know single version of truth repositories of your golden records so the confidence that you can have in the answers is based on the confidence you can have in your data warehouse how you know governance and all that in the back end but also what mike indicated so what they're doing is intention inference and basically that's the next generation of query optimization where now they're using llms to refine the query in line with the intention as inferred by an LLM. So because the LLMs are, are neural networks over time as fresh data based on interactions with end users comes in, the models, the LLMs themselves will, will be continually retrained on fresh interaction data and get smarter and better at inferring what the user intends. So over time, if LLMs are managed properly, then you should have as a user greater confidence that they're inferring your intention more accurately. Terrific, we'll move on to the next question here. Uh, Mike, again, we'll start with you here. How much foundational metadata and data modeling is required for LLMs to drive AI chatbots in BI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly in in our case, you know, for the use case that I showed you, um, you know, it's as good as the metadata that we're capturing. Now, at Metric Insights, we're kind of in this unique uh, situation where that's what we do. The power behind our platform is being able to have this plugin architecture where we can connect to multiple sources of BI, ingest metadata, enrich metadata, and, and have this, you know, um, um, rich set of metadata against all the technologies behind the scenes. And, you know, without that, um, you know, um, the, the recommendations are going to be very limited. So I, I think it's super important um, in, in the whole scheme of things for, for an application like we're doing. Now, where the LLM comes in is that inference piece, right? The metadata doesn't contain the data, right? So if I ask a question like about a particular product or a country or a region, um, having that understanding within the LLM to know what it is I'm referring to and being able to then match that into um, searching through the metadata is, is where it comes into it. So super important is, is, uh, is, is the answer to that. And Jim just made the point about sort of continually you know, being able to refresh that metadata and understand what is out there and keep it relevant. And yeah, that's, that's great, Mike. So I'll add that, you know, what amount of data modeling is required? Well, the magic of LLMs or the beauty of LLMs is that you don't need a lot or any actual data modeling, rather, the data upon which the LLM is being trained is stored in a data lake or whatever. And then the LLM itself is built to basically infer patterns in this vast corpus of, you know, for example, user queries and responses. And then based on, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, parameters that it identifies in the the sort that data that is being trained upon the LLM uh, should get smarter and smarter on you know how to infer a user's intention in terms of you know what kind of a report or what kind of visualization would meet their needs so that these foundation models these LLMs are foundation models 
um, can incorporate a wide range of data and metadata. In fact, the more metadata, metadata they have that's relevant to the solution domain BI, in this case, the the more light, the more they are able to learn all the the, uh, the relevant patterns, and do their jobs better at inferring intent. So to deliver to the user then the most relevant results based on their query. So explicit, you know, top-down data modeling of the old you know, style, like, you know, how you built a data warehouse or a data mark is not required for LLMs. It's still required for data warehousing behind the scenes, obviously, to serve all the relevant data and so forth to the BI portal, but it's not required data modeling to build and train an LLM to do its job effectively. Hey, Andrew, I just saw a couple of questions in the chat here around sort of people saw sort of Calibra in, in my, my screenshot examples. Maybe I can just answer those very quickly. Um, so, you know, uh, Calibra is not needed for, uh, for metric insights. We have integrations with a lot of data catalogs like Calibra. Um, it's a source of metadata for us um, that we can pull in if a data catalog exists like Calibra or Relation or Purview. Um, metadata for us comes from many different sources, the tools themselves, um, data catalogs potentially if they exist. Um, it's often also just added as part of the publishing process of, of a particular report. The analyst or the business user might add in their own definitions directly within Metric Insights. Um, but you know, if, if data catalogs exist out there, then yes, that's something we can leverage in the Metric Insights platform. Terrific, yeah, thank you for doing that, Mike. Um, we'll move on to the next question here. We've got quite a few coming in regarding how to protect their own proprietary data and still be able to tune the LLM. Uh, maybe you can both speak to um, how to protect this data from, from being shared or reused or uh, anything like that. That would be great. Yeah, I think for us, um, so one of the, there's, I guess, a couple of answers to that for me. Um, one is we are not um, dealing with the actual data at all in this use case uh, that I've spoken about. There's certainly, and I think I saw this question as well, there's certainly vendors out there who are using AI to, you know, look at the data and build visualizations on the fly or analytics on the fly. And yeah, they have those challenges for us. It, it's, you know, it's, it's metadata, and typically that is not particularly sensitive. Um, um, the other uh, answer to that is we are, one of the reasons we are building this concierge or have built this concierge in a generic way that it will work with other LLMs is there's certainly vendors out there building models that are more sort of on-premise or you know, less sort of public cloud focused. Um, so that we can leverage those in highly sensitive um, environments where there is this uh, um, requirement that we're not sending stuff out, out to the cloud in, in any form. So you know, having the flexibility to work with different technologies in this space, I think, is important as well. And I'll just add that um, I'm aware of a lot of what's going on in research and development related to LLMs and data security, and I see a fair number of R&D initiatives to build strong data masking capabilities uh, into the APIs um, and SDK that developers are using to build these chatbots, chatbots that can talk to the like of GPT-4 and others so that uh, masked, uh, masking of sensitive data can be handled automatically within the application so that third parties are never able to, the, the, third parties who are managing the uh, LLMs um, in the cloud or wherever don't have access to the mass data, but can still return responses to, uh, to queries um, and prompts um, against the LLM that are useful and that can then at the, you know, the client and the client can then reconstruct the full response to that prompt by inserting in the masked, the data that had been masked. So that in other words, what I'm getting is data masking is being brought into the state of the art about how LLMs operate in a secure world. Um, and it's exciting to watch what's being developed. And I expect we will see these capabilities, these masking capabilities built into all commercial grade LLMs within the next two to three years. It's just gonna to have to happen. 
Okay, I think I'm going to squeeze one last question in. Um, Mike, again, back to you for the start here, but would love to hear uh, your thoughts, Jim, as well. Will BI departments exist in five years, and how will they be structured? Yeah, I mean, five years is a long time, right? I'm sure they will. I, I guarantee they will. You know, what it looks like, I yeah, I think short term, I think, uh, you know, as, as hopefully I've tried to allude to in, in this presentation, you know, it's very much an augmentation that you know, maybe gives BI teams the ability to work on what they actually want to work on, right, rather than answering the phone for five hours every day. Um, so I, I, I see it as a, as a sort of opportunity for BI teams to, uh, to be more productive, to be able to, uh, you know, do more detailed and, and creative work. Um, you know, whether that changes moving forward, I think that question is one that the world is trying to answer now, right? Not just related to BI. So uh, in the short term, I see it as a very, uh, a very interesting technology to, to help out B, BI teams and, and bring them to the forefront. But Jim, I, mean, I know yeah. you've been thinking yeah. about these things a lot. So, you know, we'll still have teams in five years that manage all of your legacy BI assets. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll also have every team out there now in the technical business side of your organization will will be permeated or infused with BI literacy and competency everywhere as everybody begins to uh, acquire these skills and tools and be building reports and dashboards and so forth and using, you know, LLM augmented capabilities uh, within the BI experience to pull data from hither and yon and do amazing things. So, you know, the, the business analytics uh, skill set will be pervasive and the people who are the BI specialists will, well, like they're now increasingly playing within broader teams a specialist of data science and data engineers, data curators and so forth within a collaborative cloud centric environment to manage a growing range of analytics applications and assets and data and so forth. That's a long winded way of saying the BI teams are not going away, but they're in many ways becoming as it were embedded in every team and also in basically in, in our skulls, everybody will have a basic working knowledge of how to do BI, you know, using self-service tools to suit their needs and to suit the needs of their teams. And okay, well, unfortunately, this does bring us to the end of our time today. Uh, so please allow me to thank our speakers. We did hear from James Kabilis with TDWI, Mike Smitherman with Metric Insights, and would also like to thank Metric Insights for sponsoring today's webinar. Please remember that we recorded today's webinar and we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version of the presentation, which you can feel free to share with colleagues. Uh, also, if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you can look at the resource window to download the PDF. Finally, I'd like to remind you that TDWI offers a wealth of information, including the latest research reports and webinars about BI, data warehousing, and a host of related topics. So I encourage you to tap into that expertise at TDWI.org. And from all of us here, let me say thank you so much for attending. This does conclude today's event.